Welcome to the XM Podcast. Here is your host, mental health therapist, Matthew Kanebi. I am very hard on myself, dealt with severe anxiety. And it made me feel like a monster. I didn't have the energy to care. There was just nothing more but to face what I had been running from. I'm already an anxiety-filled mess. It's just love. Like, it just goes back to love. Well, welcome back to the XM Podcast. We are now knee-deep into Season 4 and have put out over 70 episodes since launching just a few years back. Thank you for listening and sharing our podcast. It truly is amazing. Today, we have a second interview with a returning guest who, over the course of this year, he and I will continue this conversation about different aspects around the role of leadership and ministry. Today, we are talking about our guest's book, The One Jesus Loves and how intimacy is something not only that we need with God, but is also desired by God. Please welcome author and president of Emerge Counseling Ministries, Dr. Robert Crosby. Really good to be with you again. I always enjoy having a good conversation with you, Matt. So um, today, uh, before we get into our topic, I'd, I'd love for you, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. Mm-hmm. I'd love you to share something uh, a little interesting about yourself that people may not know about. Sure. One of my favorite questions, by the way, <laughs> Sure. The, uh, the, the first books I ever wrote were about questions because I've had to learn to use them mm-hmm. and the work that you do, you're using them all the time, especially with, uh, with XM. Uh, one thing about me, other than the fact that I really love lasagna, you're not supposed True. to love things, but lasagna story. is like, you know, great. I uh, lived in Boston a number of years, so can't, had some of the best lasagnas ever made, um, is is when I went to New England to become a lead pastor, about two years after I left, I began to develop some real challenges with my voice. And I thought, wow, do I have laryngitis? What is it? And one night preaching a sermon on Christmas Eve, my voice went totally out. And, you know, it was a shorter message, Christmas Eve service, so I kind of wrapped it up. And uh, on the way out of the church, people are patting me on the back. Hey, pastor, rest up, take care of that voice. You must have laryngitis. And I was, yeah, 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 well, you know, it was very, very weakened. And uh, the next morning I told Pamela, you got to pray for me. I said, this is not laryngitis. Mm -hmm. So that led Matt to a series of months going to different doctors, speech therapists, different people before it was finally diagnosed as a vocal condition, a vocal cord condition uh, called spasmodic dysphonia. When I heard that, I'm like, I don't even like that name. (laughs) Sounds sounds horrible. (laughs) Don't don't, don't even like that name. But um, it it led to uh, a challenging period, obviously, because I I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm in Boston, I'm pastoring a church, I'm on, I'm leading three different boards, uh, and now I'm having trouble talking. Mm-hmm. So I went to many different specialists before they began to kind of help me with some treatments that that were helpful to me, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and yet it has been, you know, a challenge over the years. It's meant that, uh, you know, uh, all of us kind of have a thing that we deal with or wrestle with. Yeah. And this has been the thing I've wrestled with. Um, it has not kept me from preaching, teaching. Uh, you know, I've taught in a university. I still travel and speak. Um, but every now and then I'll tell the story that, you know what? There was a period in my life when I really lost much of the use of my voice. During that season in the church, we just amplified me more. I went to different specialists. But, you know, Matt, it became frustrating because I was even having difficulty talking one-on-one. Yeah, and uh, and so that impacted our marriage, me and Pamela, for a little while. You know, communication and marriage are kind of important. Yes. Um, But it led to me through frustration, beginning to do something that I'd really been praying about for years. And I had done a good bit of writing, publishing articles, but I always wondered, should I write a book? And uh, and out of it, when I was struggling to talk, I began to write. In the next four years, God opened up doors for me to publish uh, nationally, to write books for families, for believers, and he just opened up doors all over in mm. ways that I never would have imagined. And then little by little, more of my voice returned. And during that season, I felt like, okay, God, 
you know, if one door shuts, pray because there may be another one God is opening. Mm. And God began to open up the door of writing. It's kind of like he gave me a different voice during that season when I was struggling with my voice. And uh, and yet, you know, it's still something with God's help that I manage. It does not keep me from doing the things God has called me to do. I mean, uh, you know, speaking, leading, traveling. Um, but it is one of those little things. And like Paul's thorn in the flesh, I've said, Lord, you know, you could take this away. I believe you're a God that can heal. Yeah. I had so many people anoint me with oil when I was in the role in Boston. And we continued another 12 years there before going to a university role. I told people I was the oiliest pastor <laughs> in New England. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but through it, God is, has helped us. And he's uh, given me some some good doctors that are, are helping in different ways. And uh, but yeah, yeah, that's something about me that most people would not know, but uh, mm-hmm. I'm delighted to share it because God reveals his strength sometimes through our weaknesses. Totally. I, I've been very fortunate to, um, you know, become friends with you, work with you for the last several years, and I've seen you speak mm-hmm. numerous times now. And mm-hmm. um, I have a massive empathy as a singer um, because when I toured, I would wake up in the morning after being on the road for a week, two weeks, three weeks, and just going, is it there today? Because it's like my whole yeah. livelihood yeah. was around my voice. Yes. And I know that anxiety mm-hmm. and that fear. That sure. It's like, oh my gosh, if I can't sing today, mm-hmm. my value was hit by that. My yeah. self-worth was hit by that. You know, all of these different aspects. And, you know, you and I've talked before. It's like, you know, I've... I've sat and, and watched you uh, uh, preach and, and speak to, mm-hmm. to rooms. And there's times where I'm like, oh man, it's not there today. Like your voice. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I just have this empathy and I just pray for you. And I'm just like, Lord, let yeah. him get through this. And then yeah. you, as, as you and I've talked before as well, it's like, it seems like, you know, things are going well and your voice has been, been going well for a while now, which is yeah. a, a huge praise because I know you do a ton of traveling. I know mm-hmm. you do a ton of speaking. Yes. I know that's a big part of your role at Emerge. And sure. So, yeah. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, you know, when we made the move to New England, uh, sw- switched some doctors and there was a little bit of a rocky period there. But now God's put us in touch with uh, a team that's doing a great job. So it, it's just felt so much improved and uh Kind of like a bird out of a cage. So I got yeah. I, I got some lost time to make up for That's it. That's right. That's good. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Sure, I, I always sure. appreciate, you yeah. know, the the realness and the um, just, you know, I think a lot of times it's important for, for listeners and for people in general just to kind of go, you know what, we're all dealing with stuff on yeah. some level. And yes. that's okay. It's mm-hmm. it's part of the human condition, the, the part of um, living on this side of heaven, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so I, I appreciate that. Um, that's not what we're talking about today. We're going to get into a whole different topic, but I think that that was a a great lead into what we're going to be talking about. Um, Share a little bit about your heart in the intimacy um, that we need to have with God and and a little bit what we're going to be talking about on our uh, podcast today. Yeah. You know, you know, Matt, um, I became a believer when I was about 16 years old, Uh, went to Myrtle Beach with my family uh, to just you know, spend a couple of weeks at the beach, enjoy it, had a friend with me. And, uh, you know, my goal at age 16 was very focused to meet girls. Right. And uh, the day after we arrived out of a campsite of 2000 people, 50 Christian kids camp right next door to us. Oh my gosh. And so within a couple of days, they had shared the gospel with me and I was opening my heart to Christ. And I went back home right in the middle of my high school years in between 10th and 11th grade. And I look at my life as before that summer Mm. and after that summer, everything changed. And I began to discover that God was more than a religion and a church service that I went to on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I was raised in an old line denominational church and many of them are wonderful, but the one that I'd been in really had not taught me about what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus. And now here were these young people talking about Jesus like he was their friend that they hung out with every day. Yeah. And uh, so as I began on my own in the next couple of years to read the Bible, soak it up, you know, began to run into things like in the Gospel of John, where Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Mm. And that just lit something within me. Really, God, through Jesus, you want to be my friend? 
you know, the, you know, I have kind of high expectations with friends. You know, you're going to spend time together. You're there for one another. You hear one another, celebrate one another's joys. You weep with one another over struggles. And, uh, and so I've been on a quest of learning more about that. So, you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier that when I lost my voice that I began to write. Well, one of the books I wrote is called More Than a Savior. Um, and the, the subtitle is, is When Jesus Becomes Friend. And, uh, and in that study, I really looked at the, the um, John the Beloved who wrote John's Gospel. And the more I read about him, I'm like, there's a case to be made that he was the closest disciple to Jesus. Mm -hmm. If I were an investigative reporter, I think I could make a good case for that. Certainly, he remembered and recorded more of the words of Jesus than any of the other disciples. And he seemed to talk very little Mm -hmm. in the gospel. So it seems like he had a heart to listen and to learn and grow. So uh, there was one chapter in that book called How Far?, And it really related to the circles of intimacy around Jesus, Mm. Uh, the crowds, the 5,000, the 70, the 12, the three, and the one. And little by little, over several years, that just began to kind of come together for me as as a bit of a model for getting closer to Jesus. So so there's a book that that I wrote called The One Jesus Loves. The subtitle is Grace is Unconditionally Given. Intimacy must be relentlessly pursued. In other words, God's grace is free and given to everyone who receive it. Mm -hmm. But closeness is kind of optional. Mm -hmm. That's something, and it's kind of like in a marriage. You know, you can get married. You can get married. I'm married, yes, but are you close with your spouse? And so, the pursuit of closeness to Christ is is something that I still have a long way to go in. But to me, it's like the wonder of the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. And, you know, related to Emerge and the counseling that we do, of course, uh, the founder of Emerge, Dr. Richard Dobbins, one of the things that he led Emerge into is working with ministers, pastors, churches. We counsel people from all walks of life in Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, you know, many that are part of churches, some that are not, but, we, you know, we're open to counseling just about anyone that will come in. Um, but when it comes to ministers, we have had hundreds, if not thousands over the years of ministers and missionaries come to emerge in Akron. They have come really to, uh, to get help, Mm -hmm. maybe in the midst of a struggle in their marriage, maybe a financial struggle in their life, something that's happened at the church, a crisis, something with their children and they've come and, you know, Dobbins was asked the question, is there any common denominator among ministers that fall into something devastating, Mm. you know, uh, moral failure, adultery, whatever it is. And he would always bring them back to this one word, intimacy, intimacy with God, intimacy with their spouse and, uh, and intimacy with friends. Yeah. So if it, I think this is a, a brilliant concept, and I, it, you, again, this is something you and I've talked about uh, before, um, but I think it would be beneficial. What does it look like as a Christian um, to be intimate with God? I, I think that's, um, it's an easy thing for us to say, but what does that mean? What do we need to be doing? What do we need to be thinking about? What are some of your thoughts around that? Yeah, you know, the term uh, intimacy, you know, often, let, let's say if you talk to a bunch of men about intimacy, Probably many of them are thinking about sexual intimacy, you know, for sure, (laughs) marriage and, you know, all of that. But intimacy is a word that goes beyond that. It it is interesting that in the Bible, uh, when it talks about the fact that uh, that that Adam knew his wife, the the Hebrew word yada really means like a sexual closeness, a, a full closeness. Well, some of these concepts really play out into the New Testament. You know, the, the New Testament word for worship is proskuneo, which means to kiss towards. Mm. You know, there's an intimacy to it. So we tend, because we've soiled sexuality in our culture, mm. we tend, when we hear sexual, we think, oh, selfish, you know, dirty. You know, sometimes, sometimes we think of it that way. Yeah. But really, God created it. Mm-hmm. And, and it's beautiful. And there, there's, a, there's a connection that, that represents something of the heart of God. Mm-hmm. So there's beauty in it. And I think, uh, as Christ followers, one of the challenges and opportunities that we have is to represent the beauty and the wonder and the creation created brilliance 
of marriage and, mm-hmm. and what that's supposed to be. But when it comes to intimacy with God, it really comes down to the word closeness, mm-hmm. being close to God. You know, the, the New Testament uh, says, James said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You know, come close to him and he'll come close to you. In other words, he's waiting. And I think intimacy with God means something a bit different to me now than it did when I was a new believer. Mm -hmm. Um, A new believer, you know, my sins forgiven, coming to know Christ. It's like you want to go out and hug a tree. (laughs) You're just just excited. Everything looks new. But then I think as we walk with Christ a bit, almost like as we're married a while, Mm -hmm. it can get stale. It can get routine. You can, let's say you can say, I'm going to get up in the morning and pray for 15, 20 minutes or whatever before I start my day. And maybe the 20th day, you're like, okay, what do I pray today? Mm -hmm. And am I praying the right way? And is God impressed with it? Am I getting him to do what I want him to do? And, and yet the more we grow in Christ, we see that really prayer and intimacy with God is being with God, being mm-hmm. close to Him. Sometimes it's, it's being still. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's reading His Word and just pausing to think about a phrase that He said and how that's how that impacts me. Sometimes it's getting up and just pouring out your heart to God. God, mm-hmm. life really is is hard right now, mm-hmm. and I need to tell you why. And I just need. <laughs> It might almost sound like complaining to God sometimes, but he's he's big enough to deal with it. Yeah. Um, so I think intimacy comes down to closeness and uh, looking at the different people around Jesus. I think I began to observe some different measures of closeness. Mm-hmm. And what would be some of those? Well, uh, the way the book, The One Jesus Loved, describes it and is set up with like 40 short readings. Um, and it begins with the crowds. You know, when you think of Jesus coming on the scene in, you know, in, in Palestine, uh, there were the crowds. There were those masses of people. And imagine you or I are at the back of one of those crowds seeing him for the first time. Yeah. So when you're in the crowds, you're listening and watching from a distance. That was my experience early on. Yeah, I hear about Jesus or every now and then I hear a sermon, and, but I'm, I'm way in the back of the crowd, but I'm, I'm listening and I'm watching. Oh, is that, did he just heal someone? Then the, the 5,000 was the next group that we see him with. Mm-hmm. Those were the people you remember. He fed them miraculously, multiplied the fish and the loaves of bread, and he healed them. That's kind of when I become a bit of a consumer of Christ. Mm-hmm. He helps me with something in my life. You're like, wow, you know, yeah. God can actually help us. And, and then the 70, that's when he sent the disciples out two by two. I want you to go into all these villages and help people, serve people, minister to people, bless people. That's working and serving. A lot of times in churches, we have people that work and serve. Thank God. I've been a pastor. Thank God for the people that are willing to work and serve, be a part of events, kids ministry, working in the parking lot, you know, serving on boards, all of that working and serving. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to just go there. It's almost like someone has said, you, you don't want to mistake... Um, it's not just about the work of the Lord, but it's about knowing the Lord of the work. Yeah. So that, that personal intimacy. And then when you go from the 70, the next group was the 12. Mm-hmm. And those are the ones that he called to do two things, leave everything and follow him. That's kind of where the rubber meets the road. And we go from being just curious people mm-hmm. to followers disciples and uh, and we're laying something down to follow him and that's and i think just about every honest christian would tell you there's been a point in their life where god has said if you're going to walk with me you've got to lay this down a relationship a habit whatever it is and then the three uh, that's one of the stories i love the most because there was a day you remember when a woman went to jesus she said do something for me it's almost like when a kid says to their parent do, I want you to do something, but they won't tell you what it is yet. They just want you to say yes. Mm-hmm. And this mother said, I want you to do something for me, Jesus. And he said, well, what is it? When you come into your kingdom, I want my two sons to be on your left and your right. Mm. I want them to be the closest disciples to you. You remember when the other disciples heard that, they were bugged. Mm-hmm. They were bugged over that. But Jesus never reprimanded her. He said, that's not mine to decide, that's my father's. But then he looked at James and John and said, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Can you go through the suffering that I'm going to go through? And oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> they had no idea what they were saying. Mm-hmm. But if you follow that story to the end, two of the three closest disciples to Jesus, other than Peter, 
were her two sons, James and John. So watch out when a mother asked Jesus to do something. Wow. Um, they were the closest. And you know how you know is because at the Garden of Gethsemane, the deepest place of suffering, who was there? Peter, James, and John. Mm-hmm. At the Mount of Transfiguration, the highest earthly point of Jesus' glory, when his body was transfigured, who was there with him? Peter, James, and John. Mm-hmm. So that mother got her prayers answered so when a mom pray and there's a mom listening today that's praying for a son or a daughter i just want them to be as close to you as possible jesus Mm -hmm. i would say keep praying those prayers because by virtue of that story that's an important prayer yeah but then there was one disciple who was the closest of all Mm -hmm. uh the most intimate with christ and he followed Jesus to the place that no other disciple we see showing up, no other of the 12 showing up. And it was John. He followed Jesus all the way to the cross. And we know because at the cross, Jesus said to Mary, woman, behold your son. Mm-hmm. And to John, John, behold your And others, John, you're such a good friend. Mm-hmm. I'm going to trust you to take care of my mom when I leave. Yeah. And John, you're so beloved that mom, I'm going to trust you to keep an eye out for him mm-hmm. after I leave. So there's some tender insights and in, in, uh, that, 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 yeah, and you remember? You remember how John referred to himself in the gospel? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Yep. I'm sure the other disciples will love that when they read that. Yeah, right. Not a disciple whom Jesus loves, but right. the, and I don't believe he said that to be arrogant. I think him saying that shows you that when you know Jesus, he loves you so much, you feel yeah. sometimes like you are the only one that he loves. Yeah. Dr. Crosby, I think that's such a great concept, the way you've kind of broken that down, different levels of the the numbers, the 5,000, the 70, the 12, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And um, I, I think that, you know, the intimacy that I've noticed is the more and more I spend time with somebody, the more and more we grow together, mm-hmm. the more and more I spend time with a friend. Uh, The more and more my wife and I spend just quality time together, we grow in intimacy. I think God wants the same thing with us. Mm -hmm. I I think a lot of people think their relationship with God is a prayer that goes one way uh, from us saying things that we're thankful for and things that we need. And that's Mm -hmm. like this one way relationship. But as I've matured in my faith, I've found the relationship is more sometimes me just being quiet. Yeah. And being with him yes. and spending time with him, being in the word and just getting to know his character. Mm-hmm. And then not only just reading the word, but letting the word become a living, breathing thing in my life. Yes. You know, I've done calm space where, you know, I've talked about being able to spend time with the Lord uh, because the Lord dwells within us and being able to do that. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I, I wrote in one of my Bible studies the other day, and this is speculation, I have no idea, but. I just, in my life, when I hear God's voice, you know, when you, you watch a movie and they, they, um, portray like a God type figure, it's this massively loud, Mm, huge reverb voice. Like I am the God of what I don't think that's his voice. Like when, when we look at Genesis and he says he spoke things into existence, what I hear sometimes him say is Matt, Matthew, you know, and you have to get intimate to get to that voice. It's true. And we live in a world that is distracting. We live in a world that is noisy. We, are, we live in a world, my wife and I were talking the other day. She's like, I feel uncomfortable when like at least a TV's not on in our house. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we have to shut those things down mm-hmm. to be able to get there. Any of that resonate? With oh, you? it totally does. Um, you know, I just got done uh, writing an article with uh, one of our wonderful counselors, Dr. Don Litchie on being still. Being still, yeah. you know, in God's presence. And one of the things we talk to talk about in it is that we live in such a noisy world. Mm-hmm. Not only noisy conversationally, but now technologically. Yeah. You know, because even just my phone that's over there next to me right now, <laughs> right. That there, there's something almost uh, that at times, can call, hey, you, you probably want to check it. You need to look. You might be missing something. The FOMO, you know, that they, they yeah. can go with it. And I hear you talk about this often, Matt, when you speak and present uh, that, we, you know, we just need these times in our lives. We just shut that thing off or we put it aside. Yeah. We we don't let it rule us uh, because it does. It captures a lot of time that God loses with us. But I think what you said about listening to the the voice of God, learning to discern it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you remember the Elijah story mm-hmm. where he looked for the, the voice of God in the earthquake and the, you know, all these big demonstrative Steven Spielberg like effects. Yes. Yes. And then he got quiet and he heard a gentle whisper, yes. still small voice of the Lord. And I believe that's true. And, uh, and I think he's speaking more than we know, yeah. uh, the challenges that we need to listen. Yeah. And, you know, the more and more, and this is probably redundant, but the more and more I learn about who God is, he's counterintuitive to what this world thinks he should be. If, if you are trying to find rest, then you're getting quiet. If you're trying to find that, that moment of stillness, then we're getting quiet. And, you know, so many things you and I've talked about anxiety, you know, God's like, don't worry about all of these things. Just Mm -hmm. rest in today, rest in me in the moment. I'll take care of you. But we're not just in our, especially in our culture wired that way. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, go, go, go busy, 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 worry about the future. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't have a job if that wasn't the case. And I've told people this, Mm -hmm. I, I pray for a day when I don't have to do my mental health work. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, is I believe that that's going to be on the other side of this experience. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> it's not going to be on this side. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one way you know that we're <clears throat> we're very uncomfortable with uh, quiet yes. is when you step on an elevator. <laughs> totally. You get an elevator and, you know, you enter into the, a different kingdom. It's like the rules of the elevator. Yeah. One, you cannot look at anyone. Yeah. You can only look at the numbers on the wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not supposed to breathe. You know, don't talk, you know, be completely still, stand as far away from the other person as you possibly can. Yep. And we get all rigid in elevators and then let a little two-year-old toddler step That's on. So they, good. they don't know the rules. Yeah. They're tugging on your coat. They're seeing what you have in your bag. Yeah. They're looking at you and, you know, and laughing and, you know, what and all it because they're not bound by those rules. Yeah. And, um, and we, we often live in a world like that. We're, we're afraid of silence. Yeah. That's so funny. You mentioned that my, my daughter, um, she is so funny on elevators. Like she'll walk in and she'll just like, she'll walk in and she'll just face a wall because you know, it, and it makes other people in the elevator very, very comf- uncomfortable. And then I don't think she understands sound quite yet because she'll be like, why is that person doing that? Like they can't hear. <laughs> it's just, uh, uh, that, yeah. I think uh, an elevator is such a, a great social experiment mm-hmm. for so many different yeah, things. It really is. That's good. It really is. I heard of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one guy that got in an elevator and when he got on, he turned his back to the door mm-hmm. and he looked at everyone. He said, you're probably wondering why I called this yeah. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's so funny they broke, probably broke wondering why i brought you all got brought you all here well, there was, but you know getting back to to intimacy with god mm-hmm. and his voice that is one of the goals that we would be close enough to him that we could sense what he's directing us to do and uh you know the the spirit of god speaking to our hearts and lives and the the intimacy like that is I believe what Jesus wants to bring us to. Um, You know, when he said he was going to leave and I'm going to send my spirit, you know, I've been with you, but the Holy Spirit's going to be inside of you. Mm -hmm. Uh, That, you know, he was God with us, but through the spirit, he's God in us. And sometimes we look for the presence of Jesus in many different places, in a temple, in a book, and, you know, all of this. And the word of God, certainly the Bible is our, our guide for truth. But the life, Jesus said, my words are spirit and they're life. They live within us. And uh, just drawing closer to God. And, and you know, the focus of the one Jesus loves is really not so much growing closer to Christ through doctrine, but through intimacy mm-hmm. and uh, just getting closer to him. And, uh, and for, that's what he wants. For somebody listening, um, any thoughts on practicality? If, if you're listening and you're going... I love the Lord. I love Jesus, but I don't mm-hmm. feel that intimacy. Yeah. What might be some things that they could maybe begin to put into place? Well, as you say that, Matt, uh, immediately I'm reminded of a couple that comes and says the same Great. thing. You know, um, you know, how do I, how do we rekindle our marriage relationship? Yeah. Uh, and I know in a lot of pastoral counseling that I've done, I'd have a couple come in and I'd set their chairs up close to one another. And then they come in for the first session and one of them pulls one of the chairs away yes. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm already learning things, that's, you know, yeah, that's good. And, uh, and often what I would begin with, if they come in and there's great tension and, you know, no closeness and rigidity, the question I would often ask is, 
Tell me about a time in your marriage that was really good. Mm -hmm. Tell me about a time when you felt close. Yeah. And what was that like? What were you like? What was different? And I think in our relationship with the Lord, it's almost like that. You know, when Jesus spoke to the Ephesian, the church at Ephesus in Revelation, he said, he gave all these affirming things to, to, to the churches, but he said, I have this against you. You've left your first love. Mm. You've left your first love. So I know with me and Pamela, you know, at seven years of marriage, we hit a really tough point. And she wrote me this very honest letter because mm-hmm. she didn't feel like I was hearing her when she spoke to me. And, and I got the letter in a very surprising way one day. And it led to us having a long talk and me just hearing what she was feeling. Mm-hmm. But it was almost like, you know, that, that, that song, you don't bring me flowers anymore. You know, you know, yeah. we used to, you used to court me, you used to, you used to show me how much you love me. And there was a joy and a wonder to that. And I think with Jesus, it's not complicated. It's not you becoming more brilliant in doctrine or theology. Yep. I love theology. But, but theology isn't something we're supposed to rehearse with one another, something we're supposed to live with one another. Yeah. So, so in knowing God, uh, just, you know, Paul said, my prayer for the church, I think when he wrote to Ephesus, is I pray that you may know him better, mm-hmm. that you may know him better, you may be closer. I know for my children, when I pray for them, what I look for is not that they figure every theological question out that there is to figure out. Yeah. But when I sense it, man, they're feeling close to God right now. I had a talk with my daughter this week and she told me about a moment where she said, you know, with one of my daughters and she said, you know, I was just sitting at the table thanking God for all the ways he's blessed me. And I just started crying. Mm. And my husband came in and I said, you know, I, I, I want to share this with you. And they, they just had a moment together and I'm like, okay, God, I could not ask for more than that with my kids. Just sensing that they're close to Jesus. Yeah. I think it's important for people to figure out there are times where I think there are things that get in the way and that could be shame. It can be guilt. It can be the thoughts that I'm not good enough. I mean, there's a lot of uh, negative core belief systems, I think, that Mm -hmm. keep us from having that intimacy. And that might be a therapeutic um, decision that you yes. have to seek out counseling. It may be a mentor. It may yes. be um, working on some self-realization things about working through some things of your past. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of times it's not the desire for God to be in relationship with us. And that's where, well, if I'm not, I'm not good enough, so God's not going to want to be in relationship with me. We've got to get beyond that because I don't think that's true. That's, that's rooted mm-hmm. in a distortion. Yeah. It's really kind of... I know forgiveness, self-forgiveness is a huge issue to mm. develop intimacy with God because it's you, we carry so much shame and guilt. Uh, what are your, some of your yeah. thoughts around that? Yeah, you know, I'm really glad you brought that up, Matt, because there, there, in many cases, our closeness to God is limited by our distances with people. Yep. Uh, in other words, you know, we hear God's a father. Well, I hope he's not the kind of father my father is. That's right. Or God's a friend. Well, I hope he doesn't, you know, turn his back on me by like, like my last friend did. Yep. And what we tend to do is we tend to view God through the lens of human yes. relationships. Projection. But what God really wants us to do is the reverse. Yeah. That we would look at human relationships through the lens of of our relationship with him. In other words, God sets the bar for fatherhood. There's no way I I come close, but his fatherhood informs mine. Mm -hmm. So God's a communicator. He gave us his word. So I need to communicate with my kids. God tells me he loves me with an everlasting love. So I need with my kids to say, you know what? I'm glad I get to be your dad. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, Jesus was a friend that followed all all the way to the end. I mean, he kept his promise to the nth degree. So that needs to inform my friendship instead of saying, you know what? My last friend disappointed me. So probably God's going to do the same. Mm. God is the standard for relationship. And what we do on earth is a reflection. So somebody listening today, and no doubt you're thinking, you know, getting close to God as a father. I don't know how to be close to a father. I don't know how to be close to a friend. God through his spirit, through his word, through your time with them. And for some through counseling, uh, wants to help to heal that it it's all, I heard somebody say years ago, this, and it never left me. Let God love you. Mm-hmm. Let 
God love you. And it's almost like the person has a hard time receiving love in marriage or they're stiff or awkward or wounded or totally. need some healing. Um, I think every day that's, that's a challenge for me. Yeah. Uh, to say, God, how do I let you love me more? Um, and the the great thing about God is He not only loved, He so loved. Yeah, you know that's good. I years ago, um, I was praying with a client, and she had a lot of wounds from her father. And at the end of the session, I started praying. I said, "Father God," and she stopped me. She goes, "Stop! I can't. Don't call him that." And so we started praying uh, in our sessions after that, and we would just call him Abba. Mm-mm. And so for her. There was a hurdle that if she connected father with her biological father, she couldn't connect with God. But the moment, mm. God's got a lot of names in scripture. You don't have mm-hmm. to use just one of them. Sure. But she was okay if we prayed, Abba, thank you for being present today. Mm. And it's like, okay. Yeah. I mean, if, if it's a semantic thing totally. that's causing you issue from being intimate with God, we can work through that. But I, I, I just, I think it's so good to have this conversation because i think most people in their life and this is includes everybody there is a uh, core belief system that we have to overcome i I share Mm -hmm. with clients all the time and people when i talk you know the process of the human experience is we are born into this world in some way or form or another we're broken and fractured and Mm -hmm. then the rest of our life is trying to put those pieces back together right and so figuring out what is the brokenness what is the fracture is so important is it my shame is it guilt is i'm not good enough i'm not lovable and when you figure that out and then you start to recognize these are the things that are keeping me from intimacy with god well the book is called uh the one jesus loves and uh just one of many of the books that dr crosby has written thank you so much again for for being a part of this program and uh probably in a couple months we're going to do another one of these Mm -hmm. and uh, on another little uh different uh subtopic around ministry and leaders and Mm -hmm. uh, anything else for our audience today you know, the uh, the last thing that comes to mind today, Matt, and have enjoyed this uh, conversation with you, I heard a story years ago about a little boy that grew up next door to an older, like, grandmother type uh, lady, and he would go over and have, you know, snacks with her and everything, and in the kitchen, there was this big picture that she had that he was always intrigued by, true story, and the top of it, there was a big eye looking down from the sky, like just a big eyeball looking down. And then there was uh, a young man at the bottom, kind of in a shadow area. And he used to, he thought he knew what that meant. And for years he thought, well, that means that God, you know, be careful what you do because God's going to judge you. Mm. And one day he thought, I ought to ask her, what does that mean? And he said, what does this mean? And she said, well, what do you think it means? And he said, well, I think it means that God's up in the sky watching you ready to judge you because you're going to do something wrong. And he knows it. And she said, oh, no, that's not what it means. What that means is that God loves you so much. He just can't take his eyes off of you. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, that's a shift. You know, that's, good. that's a shift. That's and a we word. need to see God in a new way. And part of what Jesus did when he came he said you know you've heard this said but i say to you and he brought a whole new dimension of love so i hope whoever's listening today if you're struggling to feel the love of god uh that that god's spirit his word and maybe this time together will help you feel more of his love for you that he so loves you well thank you dr crosby for sharing with us about intimacy with our creator You can find his book, The One Jesus Loves, on Amazon. It's a great read. It's a great source of understanding how to deepen our relationship with God. Well, thank you again for listening and keeping this podcast going. It is beyond my comprehension that this thing we started continues to grow with each episode we release. We are always looking for people's stories and experiences related to mental health and what God has done in their lives. Email experience at emerge.org if you or someone you know has a story to share. Well, until next time, or when our Savior comes, God bless.